Okay, so imagine yourself being unable to walk, unable to see, and unable to speak. Your life has lived well before, but now you can't function without assistance. And although your family is there supporting you, you can't, be you can't help but begin to think, could ending your life be the answer to your pain? Your hospital bills are depleting their savings, and you feel like a burden to your family and watch as they deal with their emotional stress. You ask to be withdrawn from any medical treatment and are granted that passive euthanasia. Passive euthanasia is usually defined as withdrawing medical treatment with the deliberate intention of causing the patient's death, such as removing the respirator, life support, feeding tube, or any other method. But something unexpected happens and you end up living an additional year in pain. In all reality, this isn't something anything need, anyone needs to imagine. This is a real situation for many, many people. These people should be able to make their own choices and have control of their lives. My claim today is that passive euthanasia fails to provide the needs that, act, that active euthanasia would. Active euthanasia is taking specific steps to cause a patient's death, such as injecting the patient with lethal injection or heavy barbiturates. In practice, this is usually an overdose of painkillers or sleeping pills. In other words, the difference between active and passive is that in active euthanasia, something is done to end the, pa end the patient's life. In passive euthanasia, something is not done that would preserve the patient's life. Some researchers might find that active euthanasia would be considered legalized murder, but society already sees this with the death penalty. Active euthanasia would also respect the autonomy of the patient. One example of this prolonged suffering is the case of Karen Quinlan, seen in James Rachel's article, oh, sorry. Karen laps into a coma after mixing several pills and alcohol at a party. The New Jersey Supreme Court granted her parents the right to have the respirator removed and that Karen be allowed to die. However, because her parents did not request the removal of her feeding and hydration tubes, she survived nine more years, curled in a fetal position in a New Jersey rest home. Allowing Aunt Karen to die not only took a great deal of time, but surely a great deal of prolonged suffering only to end in death. Active euthanasia would have ended her life quickly and painlessly, which surely is what her parents and herself would have originally wanted. As for the slippery slope argument, Dr. Fe Dr. Fay from Bolingbroke University and author of The Fear of the Slippery Slope addresses this issue by stating that, especially with regard to taking life, slippery slope arguments have long been a feature of the ethical landscape, used to question the moral per permissibility of all kinds of acts. The situation is not unlike that of a doomsday cult that predicts time and again the end of the world, only for followers to discover the next day that things are pretty much as they were. We need evidence that shows the horrible, that horrible slope consequences are likely to occur. The mere possibility that such consequences might occur, as noted earlier, does not constitute such evidence. We also already see this legal murder in the death penalty, where the life of someone is taken away as a form of punishment. If death can be used as a form of, pun as a form of punishment, then surely it should be used as a form of relief to those who really need it. My last claim is that active euthanasia would respect the autonomy of the patient. When an animal is suffering, most owners would choose to put it down as an act of mercy. It seems it would be cruel and inhumane if they let their animal suffer instead of just putting him down until it, instead of just putting him down. Why can't we also perform this act of compassion with humans and respect the right to end their lives? While some may argue that this act may seem harsh and inhumane, active euthanasia would be respecting the rights and for those who are faced with the decision, would finally provide the closure they deserve as well as satisfy the patient's needs.
All right, I like the visualization that you have at the beginning as your attention device, and you do have a very clear statement of the proposition, and I think it's phrased appropriately. There's no setup of the secondary points, though, and so without that preview, material just starts kind of randomly showing up. And in the body of the speech, that uh, is evident in a couple of places. For instance, we get a refutation of the slippery slope argument before we've even got a complete explanation as to why we should uh, uh, provide this option for anybody. Uh, there's a presupposition that pain and suffering is going on. You say you don't have to imagine it. It could really happen. Well, that's what you say. Why is there, who is there that is suffering uh, pain because uh, they are in a terminal condition and they don't have access to active euthanasia? Is there nothing else that can be done about the pain that they are going through? Uh, there might be some emotional issues about power or powerlessness that could be discussed, but that's not really developed as part of the argument. There is a financial issue going on here, and I think that that, talk about a slippery slope, that is a potential problem because uh, the idea that somebody would make a decision for somebody else on uh, euthanasia because of financial considerations uh, seems to bring up uh, some pretty important moral questions, which should not be part of this argument because this is supposed to be a claim of fact. Uh, the comparison that you make to the death penalty it doesn't make much sense except in the context of a value argument. And even then, I'm, I think there's a lot of equivocation going on in that argument. But like I said, this is supposed to be a claim of fact. So uh, the, the idea of eliminating somebody's pain versus punishing somebody, uh, I don't see how those two things are comparable other than the moral issue that you were talking about. Uh, the Quinlan case is the only example that you cite here. And, of course, the Quinlan case, the, uh, the woman was in a coma prior to somebody else making the decision for her. This, so this is a different kind of case than somebody who is alert and aware and might be able to request that. And they had to go to court over those particular issues. And it's, so I'm not sure that that's the best example for that particular point. Uh, the, the idea of responding to the slippery slope argument is probably a good one uh, in the sense that it's a rebuttal argument. But it did sound, this was the only place, by the way, where I heard a specific quotation or a citation of any information, and you had an authority that you cited who basically poo-pooed the notion because uh, they say it's a bunch of hyperbole, and uh, then they engage in uh, an act of trying to shift the burden of proof. In other words, it's not that what we're doing is okay, it's that you have to prove that what we want to do is wrong. And you know, you're the one who's advocating that this ought to be something that's available or that people need this. So let's talk about what the reasons are why people need this. And I don't think that that argument responds very well to that. I thought you did a very nice job speaking to the audience. Uh, it's You're pretty energetic. A couple of times you're doing a little bit more reading than you, than you want. Um, but you also rush a bit, and you've got plenty of time, so you need a lot more structure, quite a bit more evidence, and you need to focus on the factual issue and get away from the value issues. All right, thank you.